National Development Plan bi plan la bi nga xamne ni pour plan yi rewmi la naka la ñoy def develop rewmi plan bi ni domi rew bu neka yang si am wala ndp bi lo lo mu na gis moy ma ko mati ci yoon yi bo ri passa mas fale ligi nañ fa ay yoon modern route yoon yi nga xamne ni yoon yu bax nañ te legi chono dem di taxaw wala dem di am naka naka kom problem lo lepp legi mu na wax ne passe na am school yi ñu le nay taba li ndp bi ku neka mo wara taxaw gis ne li ñu ñok mom ku neka dafa wara jël ownership ne li man ma ko mom access to water ndox tamé wara ñu ko mëna am gis nañ ñu ngi am ay bohul ñu ngi am ay ndox li yépp mu ngi ñew fi ni mu ngi mu ngi mu ngi am légui ni sax ñu ngi ñew start eh nak 86 li kilometer road moy bu ñaadu kunté haklang bobu nonu is a very big project bo xamné ni mu ngi ñew start am ci fi ak ay li bu new gis na time bu new so fok na dal am lu bari mu ngi am tam ndp bi tamé try na expand am rural electrification eh li project bi ni moy gox yi tam yeb mu na am eh li kurang kunté amna kurang ki nguur bi président moko jité dafa am ene ak ité develop rewmi luko doré ci yoon yi ndox eh ak kurang l'hôpital ni school yi lepp lo xamné ni dal social amenity la social needs la lolu dinañ try ñu am ko suñ ko muñta am tamé ci suñ bir neeki way duñu sori so jele li nga xamné ni nga tie ko ne yo yak mom in fok nga tie ko nga fonka ko be paré mu muñ la tamé ngeeri li nekkut am ci benna anam wala benna bor waye luma li dal moy euh plan la bi nga xamné ni plan yi rew mi la té pour naka lañoy def be muna develop gambia bi nga xamné ni ñu ñoko mom ci lu bari comme no fi wa ci courant ci yoni ci ndo ci school yi l'hôpital yi ak yu bari 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 té gis nañ né stana mu ngi am nanga nanga kon lolu euh naka santé la muna wax né mu ngi dem nanga nanga waaw The Gambia has been a beneficiary of the Climate Investment Fund's pilot program for climate resilience, which is called PPCR. This is a preparatory grant that was initially handed out to six countries. Um, they developed an investment plan of X number of years, and then they would be giving funding at the end of the development of this plan to implement it, to build resilience of the country, both at the community level and regional up to national level. Um, the Gambia has been given a 1.5 million grant. I think this was in back in 2015, and we've managed to use this to develop a strategic investment plan called the SPCR. This SPCR is also directly linked to the national climate change policy, and has provided interventions under each of the pillars that I mentioned earlier: uh, agriculture, landscapes, energy, uh, land use planning, etc. And each of these is having uh, components which. Uh, could be considered as a project. The entire portfolio of the SPCR is about $330 million and in 2017 I successfully presented it to the World Bank in their headquarters in Washington and they endorsed it and approved it. Unfortunately, because now there are more countries that are part of this pro program and because of the global financial constraints, they were not able to fund countries directly. But nonetheless, the Gambia has is uh, extracting proposals from that uh, investment plan developing it into a full proposal and looking for alternative sources of funding such as the green climate fund um the ppcr has been very useful in the sense that it has helped us train farmers on climate smart agriculture before the rainy season a few years ago we've also trained the media on climate change and media reporting we've also had a climate change week for students around the country from base all the way to katong and we've trained some of the office staff short term training i think about eight staff or so and we've had many workshops many sensitization programs 
and even the National Assembly members were also trained on the national climate change policy because they need to know um, some of the policies that are in existence, especially with regards to climate change, and what role they can play as representatives of grassroots communities. Um, well, luckily at the legislative level of governance, we have um, the Environment Select Committee, we also have the Agriculture and I think Natural Resource Committee, both of which provide oversight for all environment and climate change related um, activities. The Ministry interacts with them with, in the sense that we report to them on a regular basis and they scrutinize the projects that we are doing and also offer suggestions with regards to uh, which direction they should go. I think this is very important. For example, right now we've just developed two projects with WFP. One of them is very important because it's a peace building project. It's called the Peace Building Foundation Project and it's being held, uh, implemented in URR and CRR. And one of the key things which we've done is to ensure that the uh, local government have been involved in the process. They are in, because ownership in projects is very important. If you bring a project and it doesn't, it's not tailor-made to the needs of a certain people, then you know, most of the time it fails. But we've realized, and I think this has been proven a long time ago, that it needs to be from the bottom up. You need to get what people want, and then you try and um, try and work with them towards achieving your goals. That way, even at the end of the project cycle, they'll still be there. So the National Assembly's role is very important because these represent, uh, they have constituencies, and they can now also be another level of monitoring of these projects. Um, also the National Audit Office, the NAO, which do audits for all projects across the country, also report to the National Assembly. So that I think is a good oversight because they are a relatively objective institution. They are not attached to any uh, government uh, institution per se. So they can give an objective opinion on what is going right and what needs to be improved. So I think their role is, is very important, but the links can also be built further. And I think they can also be, be provided with more capacity building so that they even understand our issues even, even more because they are the ones who are representing us, representing us at the legislative level. As I mentioned, there's been training for farmers to inform them of what is climate smart agriculture. Climate smart agriculture is agriculture which some can call conservative agriculture where you, you practice measures that control the moisture you have, the amount of moisture you have, the amount of fertilizer you use, etc. But it all, it's all geared towards making sure that your output you have or the yield is, um, is a substantial one. And it's more than, science has proven that it's normally more than what you get from just conventional agricultural practice. We've also done uh, four technical studies, one of them a vulnerability assessment, which is, uh, was done the last, at the tail end of last year. Because it's like going to the hospital, you need to have a diagnosis first of what is the problem of the Gambia with regards to each region, because we are all different. And then we then had another technical study on what are the most appropriate or what are proposed livelihoods that could be introduced to some of these areas and even to look at what is working. Because one thing we always forget to do is to look at what is working and then try to expand that or scale it up. So that has already been done. And very importantly, considering a lot of what I've said has revolved around rainfall, uh, crop production, uh, losses, etc. We're also looking at trying to implement having a crop-based insurance in the Gambia. This crop-based insurance, I'm sure you uh, would, would be based on, on climatic parameters. If there's rainfall below a certain amount, then farmers within a certain region would be paid out, would be, would be given a payout. So, and I think this is, is, is something that is highly um, important. Currently, the Gambia is part of the Africa Risk Capacity, which is a regional um, crop-based crop insurance scheme being organized at the African Union level. And the Gambia is a, is a party to that, but has yet to receive a payout because we have not had uh, years where 
um, the rainfall went below the threshold. But countries like Mauritania and Senegal have benefited from this, this um, scheme. So we're trying to see now how can we nationalize this. And with this we have been discussing with the Central Bank, um, the Insurance Association, etc. to try and see how in the next three to four years we can have something like this uh, in the gallery. So these are just some of the uh, interventions that we're doing. They are multifaceted. It's not just sensitization or just training, but looking at the whole picture because climate change, as, as I keep repeating, it affects every sector. So the response to that needs to be holistic and robust, cannot just be uh, piecemeal. The ecosystem-based adaptation project is, is a very important project because it's the first project that has been approved by the current funding mechanism under the climate change framework known as the Green Climate Fund. I was lucky to have worked heavily on its development and it's, not, it's probably, you can say, it's the flagship project for the ministry at the moment because we are trying to, as I mentioned, deforest almost 10,000 hectares around the country as well as also providing entrepreneurship training and equipment for 125 communities around the country. And it's also looking to build on the, the capacity of institutions because that is something that is always, there's always space to improve that. The, especially the Department of Forest and Department of Parks and Wildlife and the Department of Community Development. They are the three institutions that are implementing this under the ministry in collaboration with the ministry. The project is, is extremely important and um, it's looking to have a lot of impact because it's, it's supporting the Department of Forestry, for example, to revamp most of its forestry stations around the country, also to create nurseries around the country so that communities in anywhere in the country, wherever you are, you can have access to seedlings so that you, you can be involved in the fight to, to the forest in Gambia. Because I remember in the, when I first started working, the Gambia was a net sink with regards to emissions. Our forest cover was enough and what we are emitting was very low, so it was almost considered zero. It was a balance between what we are emitting and what we are conserving. But now that our forest cover is dwindling, uh, we are now emitting, although it's still a negligible amount of almost 0.001%. But nonetheless, we still have to be part of the movement to reduce the greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. So the benefits are, are numerous and as I mentioned in the NDP, the climate change and environment sector is, a, is an enabler, is considered as an, a critical enabler, meaning that if all things are, are well, then it supports the overall development process. But if the environment sector is degrading, then it also has an impact across the, um, all the other sectors with regards to how much development can be made uh, within that time. Climate change, I think, is natural. There's two types of climate change, natural variation and what they call anthropogenic, a very long word, but it just means human-caused climate change. And basically started from the Industrial Revolution in the West, where they had to develop quickly using fossil fuels, that the byproduct of which was greenhouse gases, which after there's a certain concentration in the atmosphere causes the world, causes the world to heat faster. So that is basically the problem. And what we have contributed to it is minimal. The Gambia is not at fault for climate change, nor is any African country but it's mainly uh, European and Western uh, countries that have polluted the atmosphere. That's why we now require them to support us in terms of how we can get out of that situation. With regards to the problems, the problems in the Gambia are numerous. Um, we've seen flooding episodes in the last 10 years. We've had a lot of flooding in Igbo town, in Basse. Um, you can determine whether it's due to poor land use planning or whether it's due to intensive rainfall. That's up to you, but I mean, obviously, the rainfall plays a plays a very big part, as well as um, land use planning. We have agricultural crop failures. I would like to call it that. For example, I cited 2011 and some other years where we had very low um, output from the agriculture sector because the rainfall was not good enough. Even last year, we, we had, I believe, less than almost two full months of rainfall, if not, and because we experienced a lot of dry spells in between. This has a feedback because. When people invest all their money into the agriculture sector and it fails, they are forced to enter the natural resource base, such as forest, etc., and prepare charcoal or cut trees for timber, etc., which also make the problem even worse because part of the problem of climate change is that we don't have, where you have a lot of trees, you normally have a lot of exchange of water between the ground and the atmosphere. Most people don't know this. But when you have less trees, and 
I mean like ancient trees, if you go to Casamas, you check countries like Sierra Leone, countries like Ivory Coast, they have a lot of rainfall compared to us because they have more forest cover. So I think that's something that the government needs to look at again. And one of the major challenges we have is timber. Um, timber benefits few people, but then many people suffer. And I think if you go across the country, most communities are finding this as an issue because they've all realized that the benefits are not for everyone, but the problems are, the brunt of the problem is carried by everyone. So I think this is something that we can try to improve, to regulate, if not stop completely. Because on one hand, we have international taxpayer money, over $25 million given to us to deforest our country. And on the other hand, we are cutting down trees, whether here or in another country, and re exporting them. So it, it doesn't send out a very good picture of what we are trying to do. So I think we need to, to, to decide on what is our priority. That's one thing. Um, also, I mean, other measures can be brought in. For example, the issue of charcoal. Charcoal is being has been banned since 19, production since 1981 but unfortunately the use of charcoal is not banned so it means you, you cannot make it but you can use it that creates demand for charcoal and the biggest demand for charcoal is in this region the western region myself you you listening or watching me i do we are the ones who are guilty because we all cook using charcoal in senegal what they managed to do was to to subsidize the use of lpg gas for a few years to bring it down to a level where people could afford it then once people got used to this and then they managed to slowly reduce the production of charcoal, they now brought the prices back up and then everybody has, is now used to it so they cannot find a change their mode of cooking. So I think we also need some innovative practices such as that to try and change the way people live. In fact, here we also have um, a lot of improved cook stoves. We have the, the, the Kumba Gay, I think called, the other one is called Pendambai or something like that. These are cook stoves that have been developed in the Gambia by various um, NGOs, etc. But because of the prices, um, people find it difficult to buy. But these cook stoves don't use charcoal. If they do use charcoal, they use a minimal amount of charcoal because they are more efficient. So I think this is also another area where um, government can support to either subsidize or at least promote the use of some of these products which are already available. Because they always say national problems require national solutions. So I think we have quite a few solutions floating around, but we just need to, to collate them and make them in a structured way. Company. Ni atala dum fanang ibe company le kono company ye siya soto ye wale ye ye e mandingol ka fomu ye ko ni obe ye le company ni kono so we tanya nta mune kela se kemi o kemi si la tang ala fana do bije bo rejo la ala fana do bije kemi o kemi si du la muang ani luru ibo rejo la adi bo jo la mi do la wole mo ni capital game tax to diare ni nta jo la wole ko fe mana ni ni jata kendi abundal ni ni kala mo ni kuka do beka bo ni na mo ko. Badimolu, I'll see you long for Banco di Wa, Banco di Atare, Ikata Banco di Tua, Manka Banco di Tua, and Ika Kenola Wafi, Waleka Cornala Wafi, Nia Wafi Mukuma, the Jay, Waleta Giare, La Capital Gem, Taxi to Yetai de la Namojo. Okay. Okay.
xewal bu mag waccana baye ko ci gnpc ñu diko oyé december bonanza december bonanza wañi bu reuy mu di ñaari dala ci ci ñegi gasoil ak essence ci sen bëpp jaay kay essence ñu ko doré fukki fan ak juroom ci wéri december ba fukki fan ak juroom ci wéri january sa yo jëndé gasoil wala essence di nga am ñaari dala ci ci liter bu né ñaari dala ci ci liter bu né lolu nak lum téki moy ni nga jëné non nga dajalé té ni nga dajalé non nga fesslé sa tanki essence GNPC de Samba Bonanza de len jox xéti essence bi gën ci ñëk lu yomba to be honest there's been a lot of sensitization but as the adage says sensitization is a continuous process you cannot just sensitize people once and stop there because it takes a long time to change the mind set of a person and we have in collaboration with the department of water resources have done many sensitizations with regards to the climate change on itself we've also done many sensitizations with regards to the policy and roles of of local communities uh, regional governments the media etc everything that policy and we've had workshops which are more interactive where we've invited the media um train them on climate change reporting and then have uh, group breakout sessions where people interact with each other to give them more of a practical feel of of what they do um with the ministry of finance we under the green climate fund readiness we also had a monthly radio session at uh, gambe radio and television services and west coast radio where each friday first friday of each month we would meet and talk about climate change about projects that could come from climate the climate change area and we would have a phone in people would phone in and express their interest and their comments and concerns and it was very interactive because we could see that people knew about climate change but they did not know about the technicalities so it was an opportunity for us to share this with people and get a common understanding i think of course more sensitization needs to be done i think the executive needs to be sensitized the entire government basically needs to be sensitized to know that this is an imminent threat i mean look at covid-19 right now the amount of effort that the world has put into fighting covid-19 if everybody united against climate change in this way then i'm i'm sure with time it would be a thing of the past climate change affects those who depend on natural resources the most and that would have to be people in the rural setting um these are people who have to get water from a well or from the village if there's not enough rain that resource is is limited um we've seen cases when we're developing a wbb project communities where they told us that sometimes it would get so dry that they would have to decide whether they drink or their animals drink and i don't think that's a decision that any farmer needs to make to be honest um so i mean these are some of the these are some of the some of the problems that that we see we see all the time and rural communities have less financial technical or in in overall adaptive capacity to move out of the shocks that they experience we we had an incident a few years ago in uh, kuntawu where there was a flooding flooding because of surface runoff from senegal because it's a low lying area and also a lot of rain fell in that area over a short period of time this also takes me back to the national climate change fund because i remember that response of government at the time was perceived as a bit slow but um had it been that this national fund was created then the local government actors in that area could have done something before government's actual national intervention got there and this would have helped and again most of the people who suffered there are rural farmers a lot of farms were inundated and other people's houses uh, material were, were washed away so i think really it's it's very clear and among the rural people as well women and children are the most vulnerable because we know in our country gender is still an issue that people are getting to grips with um and studies have shown over and over that um women for example in the rural areas women will have to walk kilometers to get water they have to walk long distance to get firewood so if there's a degradation of this environment they would be the one to suffer because they would have to go longer distances or put in more efforts to get simple resources that we take for granted here in, in the capital I think we've we've made a lot of progress with regards to mobilizing resources. The Gambia has has since uh, 
receive more than $52 million all in, in climate change. And if you look at the agriculture sector, it's more than that. I think the Neymar Choso project was, just the Neymar project was about $80 million or so. So that's, that's a substantial amount of money. Um, although we can improve, we can always improve because there are other areas that uh, we have financial gaps. Um, with regards to impact, I think our achievements, we've, we've done quite a lot. I think one of our biggest achievements is having the national climate change policy because this signals to everybody out there that the Gambia is taking climate change seriously and have not just taken it seriously but have developed a very organized and concerted framework that is robust and looks holistically at all sectors and their vulnerabilities and also the potential for them to um, adapt to the issue of climate change. Um, also, I mean, with regards to, to projects, we've, we've developed quite a few projects. The EBA project is one of the success stories, although it's currently under implementation. The PPCR project um, gave us our, SPC, our strategic program, which is now the flagship program under the National Development Plan. Um, we have a long-term strategy. Also, our global contribution to minimizing the impact of climate change is called the National Determined Contribution, or NDC. Every country has one. And according to the UNFCCC, Gambia and Morocco have the most ambitious NDCs that if we implement it would lead us to, we would achieve the targets of the Paris Agreement, which is a temperature increase of not more than 1.5 degrees centigrade. So I think definitely the Gambia is making a lot of progress. There is a lot of impact with regards to what we are doing, projects on the ground, but I think we can always improve. We can always improve by prioritizing the environment sector. As a ministry, I mean, I think we've made quite a few achievements, especially with regards to environment and climate change. Since 94 to date, we've managed to mobilize more than $52 million of international taxpayer money to support our drive to adapt to climate change. Um, we've made a lot of progress. I remember, according to the UNFCCC, the national determined contribution of the Gambia, which is our uh, the support we provide to the global drive to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, that the Gambia and Morocco had the most ambitious um, strategic documents, and that if we implemented it, this would go towards achieving the target of the Paris Agreement, which is a temperature increase of less than 1.5. Um, Project-wise, also, we are always churning out new projects. Currently, we are working with WFP to have a new project called RICA, which is looking at um, adaptation in the agriculture sector, also in you, around URR, CRR. Um, we've mentioned the peace building project. Um, we have our EBA project, which is a flagship project for Africa, basically. No other country in Africa has been given um, the opportunity to implement ecosystem-based adaptation with such a volume of money. So I think everybody else is watching the Gambia to see what we do. And we are a leader in the area of climate change. I mean, we've had previous ministers, Fatou Gay, Fatou Day Gay, Paus Manjaju, and now we have uh, Honorable Lamin Diba. And all of them have carried the flag for the Gambia with regards to climate change at the international level and are all very highly, highly respected people who, who whenever they speak, um, international donors and partners would listen. Um, nationally also the interventions we've carried out, we've done a lot of training of the media um, under the early warning project which is under the Department of Water Resources but managed in collaboration with the Ministry. Um, there have been 14 pilot sites around the country that have radio listening groups, uh, people have been trained in these areas to receive information, meteorological information in the local language and disperse this using mobile phones and uh, megaphones so that people know when the rains will start when the rains will stop, when um, to expect um, thunderstorms, etc. Also, currently, with, in collaboration with the Ministry of Finance, we're working towards having the National Climate Change Fund I've mentioned many times. Um, this is being supported by the African Development Bank, and we foresee that perhaps before the end of one year's time, we should have this um, up and running, and then maybe try to see where we can get local funding, a seed money to start our up the process. Um, Policy-wise, we, we, I mentioned we have a long-term strategy that we're developing with IIED, the International Institute for Environment and Development. And this would, would uh, consolidate all the strategic documents we have and strategies we have 
that might not be speaking to each other but are all working towards the same direction and this could be consolidated to have one um, long-term strategy that would be very robust and the impact of which would be significant especially when it comes to building resilience of the Gambia at all levels to, to climate change, uh, to resilience, to climate, the impact of climate change. Um, I think also the relationship between the Ministry of Environment and the Environment Select Committee and also the local governments around the country is something that I think is also improving because through our projects we are helping to capacitize some of them and if not even current projects but future projects are also looking to build on all the trainings that have already been done to try and create um, a same sort of independence for the local government to be able to develop their own plans, development plans that have featured climate change and environmental issues and can be supported nationally. Because as I mentioned earlier, we have national problems should have national solutions. And I believe Gambians are competent enough to be able to deal with some of these issues. Of course, we don't know everything, but with a bit of technical, so technical and financial support, I think um, the sky is, is really the limit. Luckily, I've been a civil servant for, I think, almost 10, 10 odd years, 10 to 11 years, um, starting off at the National Environment Agency. And one thing is we've, I've noticed is there's been a change in the previous administration and the current one compared to the current one with regards to how much flexibility we have and freedom to carry out our tasks. We don't have, so far I've not experienced any interference in any of our projects with regards to where our resources go. Although and there's a certain issue that does confuse me in that even though people are given more freedom now and take potentially more resources to do work, there seems to be less vigor in terms of carrying out their roles and responsibilities, which I think needs to improve because this is our country. Nobody's going to develop it for us if we don't develop it for ourselves. So like for example, someone like me, having completed my studies abroad, I came back within a week because everything I'd studied was to come and help my country. I mean, rather than saving somebody else's environment, the first thing I should do is to come and try and do what I can here first before going out to help others. So I think we all as Gambians need to, to have all hands on deck and understand that if any failure is a failure on all of us and any uh, success is a success for all of us. We all know that the lack of good and adequate road infrastructure in the rural area has contributed to the great disparities between rural and urban communities. Today's event, therefore, marks an other significant milestone in the development endeavors of my government. As stated in our national development plan, our goal is to deliver good governance and accountability, social cohesion and national reconciliation, and a revitalized and transform economy for the well-being of all Gambians. To this end, for the first time, after many years of waiting, this project will provide for the people in these areas interlinked between those roads covering the length and breadth of the Nyomis and connecting these districts to Jokadu. This project amply demonstrates my government's commitment to inclusiveness in the Gambia. With improved road networks, the search for better social facilities and employment opportunities in the urban area will be curtailed. Because the creation of a growing business environment to improve the economic status of rural residents will become far easier 
sectorialize. As a government, we have taken the critical decision to rebuild our economy and bring infrastructure development closer to the people. To rebuild the economy, however, we must have access to good roads, uninterrupted electricity supply and technology to enhance the capacity of the people and their well-being. Laying the foundation stone for the construction of the Hakalan Road Network is evident of our strong will to ensure that no section of Gambian society is deprived of their rights to live dignified life and have their equal share of the national cake. The desire of the government is to minimize rural urban migration, increase self-reliance, and boost entrepreneurship innovation and productivity with agro-business production giving due attention. The residents of Nyomi are popular for their active engagement in gardening and horticulture. Good road networks within the area will ease travel and transportation for farm products to market points, as well as encouraging businesses to get closer to the communities. Accordingly, we will continue to encourage the young people in all hard-to-reach areas to participate actively in the development of their communities and take pride in innovative work for self-development. When completed, the Nyomi Hakalan Road Network will solely provide vital access to Lower Nyomi and Upper Nyomi districts, which have a combined population of over 70,000 residents. In particular, the feeder roads will connect the communities of Jufure, Albreda, Kermbuguma, Fas Umar Saho, Bafloto, and Kuntaya in the Jokadu district. It is the development of the people that makes national development a reality. Working together, therefore, we can attain this. Madingol, GMP Sila Natala Ninko Dima, a common December Bonanza. December Bonanza. Kakumas December 15, Tatafo January 15, a common, it had a essential or essential. A little word liter say about two dollars a sotale jail. A about two dollars a sotale jail. A gas oil muo, a essence muo. New moyo diata bake, Katuko, what o at end radi, Iba Maboro Kala. Near Maboro K, Nina Tapotenke. Ila esanso isafa ni noni wa maborola. December Bonanza. Jamala sambali na GMPC. Iko mo never caring. December Bonanza. December Bonanza. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. My government's vision is detailed in the National Development Plan of the New Gambia. It's a country where the highest standard of good governance is upheld. Citizens enjoy access to basic services and the enabling environment is created for the private sector to thrive. Today it's the turn of the West Coast region to, to officially receive this first class dual carriage which not only links Sukuta and Jambanjeli, but also passing through very important and rapid growing centers and settlements within the Kombo North District and linking Kombo South District. I do agree with the governor that the Sukuta to Jambanjeli road is potentially the most, is a major road corridor in the West Coast region that links the rural and peri-urban settings in Brikama municipality to the urban and settlements of Carnifi. The main features of these projects are 
The highway is a length of 13 kilometers with uh, two by two lane for a total of 19 meter width and parking area at some sections. Road markings and road signs, street lightning, water relocation services, demolition and reconstruction of affected fences and buildings. With all the inherent challenges, we are proud today to see the project through. Distinguished guests, the National Development Plan 2018-2021, the NDP, is the blueprint that embodies the government's vision and priorities for national development. Building infrastructure, including expansion of the road network, is one of the strategic priorities of the NDP. The completion of the Sukuta to Jambanjeli dual carriageway is an important milestone in the infrastructural development of the Gambia, in particular, Combo North and Combo South. The road starts in the vicinity of the Sukuta water treatment plants and runs through Jabang, Latiria, Jambur, and Ensat Jambanjeli. As it is usually inherent in the such complex project, construction of road has its fair share of challenges. For some of you who may not know, the project was faced with a serious challenge in the form of a very large water main in the middle of the road. And the project had to seek additional funding to overcome this constraint. The road has solved a major problem with, with transportation along the Sukuta, the Jambanjali route, surrounding villages and towns and beyond. As the project implementation agency, Gunworks is proud of this achievement. Your Excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, the implementation of the Sukuta to Jambanjali route has been a collective effort by a number of entities who have worked closely together to bring about the success that we are celebrating today. of good road network and the need for it especially in this region cannot be overemphasized. This road will solely bring rapid development to our transport system that is much needed to support the national economic and social developments not only for the West Coast region but for the entire country. As you are already aware that close to 37 percent of the total population of this country reside in the West Coast region. And this is growing by the day. On behalf of the government and the people of the Gambia, I want to extend our sincere gratitude to the Islamic Development Bank for providing the financing for this important road and other numerous development projects for the Gambia. I want to thank the Gambia, the Gambian agency for the management of public works, GAM works, for successfully implementing this road and other projects for government. Ninsilo Anafa Mota Express Lano Anafa Moment. At Goela Tatala Combo Sando Dauda or Combo Central. Estana Mela Hajo to Amas Sloblo. Estana Mebojeta Jambanjel, Jambanjeleta Bricam, Bricam Elapta Tala Daudaeta. Estana Eta Jam Eta Jambanjeleta San Eta Kundureta Kato Futat, Yokomboba. So this road is without doubt one of the most welcome developments. And the benefits of which, will, among others, will include quicker and more convenient access to the markets 
by our farming community, especially women farmers, is now assured. Health facilities can also be easily reached during emergencies, and people can definitely get to their work of places or businesses quicker and safer. These are just a few benefits of this important uh, good, public good that the government is delivering to us today, and we are indeed grateful. The Ministry of Transport, Works and Infrastructure and the National Road Authority have also played an important role in providing overall policy guidance and monitoring of the construction. I therefore thank the staff of the Ministry and NRA for their valuable inputs in this important project. The completion of the Sukuta the Jambanjeli Road is therefore an important achievement toward the realization of the goals of the National Development Plan. This achievement is due to the commitment, hard work and efforts of a number of partners and collaborators. During the construction works, we had to demolish and shift some of the fences of compounds in some locations to make way for the road. I want to thank the residents of the villages along the road for their understanding and patience. There were other institutions and agencies who, in, who were involved in the project, such as NAWEC, the National Environment Agency, the Geology Department, the Minister of Lands and Regional Government, the Department of Lands and Physical Planning. I thank these institutions. I want to recognize the efforts of the consultants to the international, especially Mr. Karamo and Mafus Engineering, Mr. Hydera, and the contractor Ariski Ali Ariski. I want to thank the officers of the the officers of the office of the vice president, the National Roads Authority, Gunworks, the different branches of the security forces. My final thanks, ladies and gentlemen, goes to His Excellency, the President Adam Obaro. For his support, for his leadership, and for his vision. As you may all notice by now, this is, if you care to notice, that this country is moving forward. His Excellency is in the lead, and nothing can stop this. I am delighted to be here today to celebrate with you the inauguration of the magnificent Sukuta to Jambanjeli Road. At this juncture, allow me to declare the Sukuta to Jambanjeli Road officially open. I thank you all for your kind attention. Thank you. 